SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey wants to shake up March Madness, but for some reason, he's Mr. Conservative when it comes to the 2025 SEC schedule. Let's talk about the boring sequel coming up in a couple seasons and more right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso, and a guy who majored in news ed journalism, and somehow that decision did not derail my entire professional career. But you know what? Coming up on today's program, I think that ESPN ranking its top 10 quarterbacks for the coming football season, Brady Cook, just outside of that top 10. I really think their whole process shows just how bad collectively we are at evaluating quarterbacks. Plus, speaking of things that are broken, the basketball replay system is completely broken. The finish to Samford and Kansas last night, another great example of that. Before I get started, though, I do want to remind you today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. And I got to say, the SEC, with its 2025 football scheduling, to me, went with the most boring sequel you could possibly imagine. Now, I'm a big, as a kid, one of my favorite movies, and to this day, still one of my favorite movies, is Beetlejuice. Well, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice coming here in a few months. And basically, the SEC went with just a shot-for-shot remake of Beetlejuice 1 is what Beetlejuice 2 is going to be in terms of the 2025 football schedule. All of Missouri's SEC opponents for this season, in case you missed it, well, they're just going to flip home and away. Going to be the same eight, se- yeah, eight opponents next season. So Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Auburn, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, Mississippi State, and Arkansas going to be that same group for two straight seasons. Also, to me, maybe the most disappointing part of this is for two years, the Tigers will not be playing the Texas Longhorns. And while a return trip to Norman, Oklahoma, hey, I'm all good with that for sure. The rest of those games, you know, going to Alabama, obviously an exciting road trip. The Tide will be returning to Columbia next season. That's all well and good. Personally, I would have liked to see the Longhorns at some point in the first couple years here. And also, it does feel a little weird that Missouri, again, for the second straight year, not playing Florida, Georgia, or Kentucky, some teams that the Tigers have faced every single year in football since joining the conference. So since we are throwing out most most rivalries, other than the very, very upper echelon rivalries, tradition, all kinds of stuff in college football. Well, at least give me some newness, too. At least give me some different road trips, some different adventures, that kind of stuff. I don't know. To me, this schedule is a little bit disappointing, if in, if I do understand it to some extent, because, again, interestingly, it does obviously seem like for another year, ESPN and, and SEC pushing off what seems like is inevitably going to grow to a nine-game SEC schedule one day, if not, heck, even 10 games at some point in the next decade or so. Who knows? But obviously, the talk right now is the move to the nine-game schedule. Well, obviously, that's going to be put off until at least 2026. Now, I do have to say for 2025, if we're going to talk about exciting, well, at least fresh, if not new matchups, the border war is back. I will remind you in 2025 in Columbia, September 6th, 
a really early, early version of that ball game. And the Tigers, by the way, also in their non-conference going to host that return game with UMass after traveling to UMass this coming season, also hosting Louisiana with a road game against Miami of Ohio currently scheduled. So that's one of those games. Hey, a road game at Miami of Ohio seems primed for one of those games that Desiree Reed Francois would have loved to have buy out or at least move to St. Louis, something like that. Will that actually happen? Is that going to be a priority under the new athletic department, if you will, under the new leadership of whoever the next athletic director is going to be at the University of Missouri? And by the way, speaking of the athletic director, still no movement on the AD front, at least as far as I or anybody on the Missouri beat can tell at this point, which in and of itself wouldn't be that big of a concern, or at least wouldn't necessarily be a cause for concern, except here's the problem. As I've pointed out many times, I think many Missouri fans right now are getting understandably nervous with no information here about the AD search because, again, to be brutally honest, this board of curators, this leadership have not really done a whole lot to earn the benefit of the doubt, and their silence on all of these topics and their lack of accountability publicly is quite deafening. I mean, really, when you have a vacuum of information and and people speaking, at least give, you know, Desiree Reed Francois, she, you know, and Mike Alden, for example, sure, they would say there's a lot of, a lot of lingo, a lot of, you know, corporate speak, that kind of thing. So they would say a lot at times without saying much, but at least she would say something. At least her face is very much out there. At least you felt like you could come up to her at a basketball game and ask her a question, maybe even, you know, put a put a put in your two cents on a certain part of the fan experience that you would like to have changed. But who is accountable in the board of curators? Who are these people? When was the last time any of them actually spoke to a member of the media? So at this point, I don't know. If, if, if I should be nervous exactly specifically about the time, the amount of time that this search is taking. But again, if you're nervous, I don't blame you because these people have not earned the benefit of the doubt. And speaking of saying a lot of words without revealing too much, well, Eli Drinkwitz talked with the media recapping spring ball recently. And again, a lot of words, not a ton of insight, but maybe the biggest thing I took away from Eli Drinkwitz post-spring comments were about Nate Noel, fr formerly of App State, the running back. Of course, no connection there between Noel and and App State, and Eli Drinkwitz, no crossover there. But on Noel, here's what Drinkwitz said. He said, man, that guy really, really had a good spring. So just lots of praise for Noel. Seems like he's a very explosive player that should fit into that outside zone scheme of Brandon Jones and Kirby Moore quite nicely. But it seems like he's maybe had some injury problems during his time at App State. If he can just stay on the field, it's possible. You never know. He could be the guy. I think a lot of people assumed Marcus Carroll was the leader in the clubhouse because he was the first guy that Missouri got at running back through the portal. But it sure seems like Nate Noel is turning a lot of heads to the point where he could either be the main guy or very much a part of a committee. Again, a committee approach would be something new for Eli Drinkwitz. But you know what? Until last season, Drinkwitz had been always been the play caller as well. So he's shown the willingness to change up some of his old things. The old dog can learn some new tricks. So I, I wouldn't put it past him. I think Drinkwitz has shown, especially with all the different changing responsibilities he's had as head coach over the last few years, Drinkwitz has shown an ability to modify his approach. And it's that's something I really admire. And coming up this season, it obviously feels great to have real real confidence in a settled quarterback position. And ESPN recently, despite our confidence in Brady Cook, ranked the top 10 quarterbacks in the country. Cook just outside of it at number 11. And really, my quibble with ESPN doesn't have much to do with Cook's actual ranking. It's more the guys 
who are ranked ahead of him. But you know what? All of this, all of my observations here, bottom line, I think this is all positive for Missouri here going forward into 2024. I want to explain what I mean coming up here about Brady, and we'll talk about Luther Burden's rankings as well. First, though, let's talk about Nissan because this week's March Madness bracket highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. And you got to go with the Oakland Golden Grizzlies. They're obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised all of us with a powerful performance in the first round upset against the Kentucky Wildcats, giving them their biggest win in program history. They say win life go rogue. And that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Or if you're a golf fan, Maybe you think maybe Xander Shoffley will finally get a win this week. Nine to one currently at the Valspar Championship. But regardless of what you're into, just visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Are you watching ESPN or Fox Sports on your television all day? Well, elevate your experience and make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for fans just like you every day with the biggest stories. Frankly, without all the screaming matches, Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis and opinions and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And before we get into the Brady Cook and quarterback discussion, one just quickly one thing on Eli Drinkwitz, a lot of fans have been wondering, why does Missouri start spring so early? Well, one of the reasons has been injury recovery. And on Brian Huff, by the way, a, a true freshman linebacker who enrolled early, basically he was the only injury that really came out of spring. He's, Drinkwitz says, quote, we came out of spring fairly healthy, the only surgery that is on our books right now, which we actually knew going into the spring, was Brian Huff. He will repair an injury from high school. He'll actually have surgery tomorrow or today or yesterday, whenever this was written. But he'll be back as a full participant by June, so that works out pretty good. So obviously, I think a lot of fans, including myself, if you were attending the black and gold game, you probably would have liked some live tackling. That's certainly a little bit more interesting and representative of actual football. But you can see the logic here. Obviously, Missouri wants to be healthy for fall camp. And while there's definitely a balance to be had there, you still need to live tackle at some point. Does the live tackling you're doing six months before the season starts how much value is there in that? Genuinely, I'm, I'm asking. I, I, I think that's just something that every good program, every coach has to be asking themselves right now. And obviously, part of the reason Missouri starting spring early and keeping it early these days, hey, with the portal opening, this just gives you maybe a jump start on the competition in terms of evaluating your roster and figuring out exactly what you need in the portal. And by the way, now that when the portal's open, you can focus on that instead of maybe your current spring practices as much. So there is all of that. But you know what? Speaking of Mizzou football this coming season, Missouri should have one of the absolute dynamite offenses in the entire country. When, well, 
Obviously, a big reason for that, Luther Burden voted the best wide receiver in the country coming into 2024. This according to ESPN College Football Experts, as they call themselves. And, well, one of our guys, a Mizzou guy, Bill Conley, he said about Luther Burden, quote, he dropped only two passes all season and finished in the top five in the nation in yards after catch, forced missed tackles, and yards after first contact. He caught a desperate fourth and 17 pass to set up a game-winning field goal against Florida and the game-clinching touchdown pass in the Tigers' Cotton Bowl win over Ohio State. So there you go. I'd say, as he says here, now Burden enters his junior season as maybe the most proven receiver in the country. And there you go. I, I think that tells you all you need to know about Luther Burden. But for some reason, it seemed like Brady Cook did not quite get the same bump that Burden got for his returning production and coming off a really good team, by the way. Now, Cook it wasn't completely insulted or anything. In the others receiving votes category, he was the first one. So basically, ESPN says he's the 11th best quarterback in the country inning 2024. What I thought was interesting is who is number one among others. Well, that's Georgia's Carson Beck. And here's the thing. I just don't think there's that big a between Brady Cook and Carson Beck. And I haven't watched Beck play enough to definitively have a take on him as a player or anything like that. Again, it's also more just, hey, who else is further down the list? Look at who's number four. Well, it's Jalen Milrow of Alabama. And to have him at number four over Colorado's Shadur Sanders, who's number eight, I got to be honest, I don't even know how to properly respond to that. It just seems like you're just you're putting so much on the quarterback win statistic there. I, I just I don't know how you really can – can watch Jalen Milrow play and think that he's a better player than Shadur Sanders. Now, Jalen Milrow has better receivers. He's got better teammates and a better offensive line and better coaches last year. No question about all of that. I, I just think when you actually look at the circumstances of those two players, you look at, hey, Milrow improved as the year went on. I agree with that. But you still saw his limitations against Michigan, especially, again, Brady Cook has his limitations as well, just like everybody, really, of all these players does, in my opinion. I don't see any Patrick Mahomes in there at the moment. But my point is, whether Brady Cook, whether you think he should be in the top 10, maybe he should be in the top 5, or maybe you think 11 is about right. To me, either way, the difference between him and, say, Carson Beck or Jalen Milrow, I just don't think there's really that much of a difference there. If you want to say Carson Beck is better, fine and dandy. I'm just saying it's not the Grand Canyon is not between those two. I can promise you that. So really, Missouri, I think, has everything it needs offensively and then some for 2024. And frankly, just this whole thing, this focus on quarterback win stats, it just shows how bad we collectively are at evaluating quarterbacks and why we're still hitting probably less than 50% in terms of NFL first rounders. Whoever figures out the formula there is going to make themselves a heck of a lot of money in the coming years. And coming up, let's talk some Mizzou hoops, including a little bit on Javon Porter, who honestly, I'm surprised we haven't heard we haven't seen any movement on the Javon Porter front yet, so let's talk about him and if newest Tiger Jacob Cruz fits a positional need or not coming up here in just a little bit. But first, I want to tell you about Fire TV channels. And Fire TV isn't just about getting access to incredible movies and, frankly, the best user interface there is out there. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. We're not talking, of course, about just smart TVs. Also, the Fire TV stick that you can plug in to your existing TV that provides access to all types of movies, TV, and sports. And Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands. We're talking March Madness, MLB, 
NBA, lots more, not to mention news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out a Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. Learn more at Amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. It seems the conventional wisdom around Mizzou basketball and the portal right now is the Tigers need to get a point guard and a big guy who can defend and rebound. Those are your two biggest priorities. Well, I can't really disagree with any of that, but I will disagree with people who seem to think that Jacob Cruz is not really a a fit in terms of a positional Need Well, I completely, completely and utterly disagree with this notion for a few reasons. Because number one, you go 0-19 in the SEC, you've got needs basically everywhere. And it's not as though while Missouri was porous defensively last year, without a doubt, they weren't good enough offensively either. And shooter, hey, that's a position too. Shooting Scoring, that's a position of need as well. Combo forward, by the way. Clearly, Dennis Gates like to have, likes to have some taller guys who, can, who have some skill. Somebody like Kobe Brown or Noah Carter. Well, who is that person who's on the roster right now, who was currently on the Tigers last season? Well, I guess it would be Trent Pierce in theory, but obviously with his lack of production last season, he, a lot of reasons for that, ear infections, rough start, blah, blah, blah. The point is, you just can't count on that next season. So to me, Jacob Cruz absolutely fits, if not a position of need, certainly a skill set of need. That's just my humble opinion. Now, when it comes to other taller players who can put the ball on the floor, shoot it, multi-positional type deal. Well, you think about the Porters sometimes. Well, Javon Porter, formerly of Pepperdine, entered the portal a week or so ago. Quite honestly, I'm a little surprised we haven't heard anything about Porter yet. I would have almost bet, if you'd have told me a week ago, I'd have thought by this time, maybe Porter would have already announced that he's a Tiger. So what does this mean? Does this mean Missouri is maybe weighing its options a little bit? is maybe Javon Porter himself weighing his options a little bit. Again, I would have thought that this would have come together by now, but for now, we wait. And darn it, when it comes to my knockout pool, I picked the wrong, hateable, blue blood team that wears blue. No, I should have taken... I should have taken Oakland over Kentucky, of course, in retrospect, but I had Samford beating Kansas, and obviously... That almost happened too, so I'm actually not upset with that process whatsoever because here's something you all need to keep in mind. It would be one thing if I were entering a contest with 10 people. Then that picking Kansas or Oakland or anybody that high would have probably been an unnecessarily aggressive approach. But with 257 entries in this knockout pool that I'm in, you got to get risky. You got to take a chance. And getting that 13 or 14 points there for the tiebreaker in the future would have been a huge edge to have. So again, 257 to 1, that's basically the Royals' odds of winning the World Series this year, right? It ain't going to happen. So how do you get an edge? Again, be aggressive. Pick a big upset in the first couple of days because once you get past Friday, your odds aren't very good at that happening. But obviously a rough day for the SEC, 0 and 3, and mostly I'd say a rough day just for officiating as well. It's just been it's not about missed calls because of course everybody including Missouri fans is focused right now on what was clearly a missed call on a block, a clean block by a Samford player on a Jayhawk at the end of the game. Of course, it was Samford was trailing by one with about 15 seconds there. The ball was in play off of the backboard if that's if there's no whistle there. So you're talking a five-on-four break there for Samford. Good chance they score and take the lead there. Obviously no guarantees. But to me, the part that bothers me there is not that there's a missed call there. You can see why if you're at a bad angle as a referee, the way the Kansas guy fell down there, 
I could see how you'd miss that call. It's a really horrific missed call and one that probably did call, cost Samford big time. But what, what gets my goat about this whole thing is during this game and many others that come down the stretch, you're constantly stopping the game for replays. Every time the ball goes out of bounds, oh, stop everything. We, we got to go to the replay monitor. So again, if that ball is hit out of bounds, instead of being blocked off the backboard and in play, well, then I guess we could what? We could have then... We could have then replayed that and seen, well, did it go off of his fingertip and all this stuff? But for some reason, you can't replay and review what was a crucial call here, a missed call on that block attempt. If we're going to have replay, that's why it should be there. But my whole thing is, to me, there's no way to fix this. Replay is absolutely broken in basketball. And frankly, it was never... It was never put together properly in the first place. It was never on a sound foundation. There's never been a proper way to do instant replay in basketball. It works fairly well in football. I'll give you that. It works okay for the most part in baseball. It works great in tennis, but it's abs- it's actually a net negative in basketball because, again, if you can only review certain types of fouls, you can't. You can only review the ball that goes out of bounds, even though when you're reviewing it, a guy is clearly smacked on the forearm or something like that. Are we getting the calls right or are we getting the calls different? Because it seems to me all we're doing is just getting the calls different, not necessarily right, and at the expense of what? Well, mostly all of our entertainment because what should be the best part of the game, crunch time, just grinds to a halt over and over and over again. And to me, that is such a much bigger problem than just one missed call on a block. Listen, I can live with that. I really can. I can live with a referee missing a block call every once in a while. What I can't live with is you guys stealing away my life by making me stare at a replay monitor endlessly. I have no interest in that. Let the missed calls even out over the long term because we're actually not improving anything with replay. We're making the product actively worse. So if you agree with me, hit me up at Locked on Mizzou, or maybe you disagree with me. Again, at Locked on Mizzou, X, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, as long as it's still legal in the United States, and email me, LockedOnMizzou at gmail.com. So until next time, I am John Miller, and thanks as always for listening to Locked on Mizzou.